Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Representative Coleman, Commissioner Lakey, and Senator Vanderbilt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So to, uh, to the legislators first, Senator Van Depu, your city, you get the first question. So why, th this was, let's leave the special sessions to the side for the moment since all the kumbaya leached out of the process in those three, or two and a half, two, two plus. But in the 140 day regular session, it was truly a kumbaya time in the Capitol with a lot of uh, 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 cats and dogs living together, as they say, people of different persuasions, politically and otherwise, coming together. And on this issue particularly, really an almost, I think it's fair to say, unprecedented progress made. Why? I am so thankful for years, the advocates, uh, both on the behavioral health side, uh, the criminal justice advocates, um, but taxpayers demanded that we do things smarter. Uh, the devastating cuts that we had in 2011 were proven uh, to be so harmful at the local level. I think, first of all, we had uh, money, a little bit more money, and the priorities were really very relevant uh, to the discussion. Other than funding for public schools and, and really restoring that and trying to make it whole, the conversations that were heard at the Capitol were those that involved mental health. And it didn't matter. Uh, Democrat, Republican, urban, rural. In fact, most of the, I'd say that the difficulties had nothing to do with partisan. It was the true division at the Capitol, which is the House version versus the Senate version of funding of a bill. And uh, we're just very, very thankful. But I think people really want to do things uh, more cost effective, yeah. but to really affect families. And there was enough families out there and the advocacy groups that the, finally the knocking on the doors and the statistics made a compelling story. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, it's not as if there are a whole lot of people out there who say, I am opposed to good mental health. You know, it's not, opposing mental health is not something you hear very much, but for whatever the reason, inside the building, there's not been the kind of support in past sessions that there was this time. No, if you go back to 2003, you'll see the drastic cuts that occurred across the board in mental health in, in, in our state budget. Um, and in terms of it getting that money back, it's taken, oh shoot, 10 years. Uh, but we had people who were advocates. John Davis, a uh, very good member from, from Harris County, had went in and said we need to slowly restore these dollars. No, no one's idea, I would observe, no one's idea of a liberal, a representative no, Davis. Not, not right? at yeah. all. <laughs> uh, but, but again, you know, I'm one of these people, I just call it like I see it. Uh, if the money was cut, it was cut. Getting it put back was very difficult. And in that same session, it, you know, people won't remember this, but all of the mental health benefit was cut out of CHIP. We had to fight to get it back. And in that same session, all talk therapy under adult Medicaid was cut out. We had to fight to get that back. And these are things that happened all in 2003. Uh, and, I, and I think it was, it was time. It was time for, for us to gather around and say, you know, it's, it's, this is a place where we can agree to make things better. However, I think there was a little incident in Sandy Hook that might have had something to do with it. Right, so new, news uh, 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 interceded, right, or, or outside events overtook, and so the conversation pivoted. You know, you have to take what you, it's, it's a hard thing to go through for a family, but I think that we responded to it in a very good way. Right. Uh, uh, particularly the bills that passed that put that kind of spotlight on children, Yep. schools and training teachers uh, across the state and, and actually funding it right. and the bad word in the legislature mandating it, yeah. uh, which uh, I was fortunate enough to work on that bill with Bob Duell and, yeah. uh, and so it's a good thing. I think good things have come from it. Well, I want to come back and talk about that piece of legislation in a second specifically. Commissioner, did you perceive the need that you heard Chairman Van Der Poot, Chairman Coleman talk about going into this session? You've had your job long enough, not all the way back to 2003 but you understand what they're talking about in terms of work that was undone prior to this session. Absolutely. I think, you know, we had a very good session, and the, the individuals sitting to my right and left were, were critical components of that. Yeah. Um, but I think this session, we built upon the last several sessions. 
Uh, there were reports that came out. We had, during the 80th legislative session, crisis services, and then there was an external evaluation that showed the cost effectiveness yeah. of that program that ke kept individuals from ending up in the jails and the hospitals. Uh, you know, last session was a very tough, tough session, uh, the 82nd session. Um, but mental health was, was preserved in many parts, and it was actually had some additional funds that w were uh, put into mental health. And then I think the events of, you know, the unfortunate events of, you know, December that led into the, the session just shone a light on the, the challenge that we have in mental health. And, yeah. and that this can be a, a bipartisan issue, that, that both parties can come, all three parties can come yeah. together and support the, this issue. And, and the agency uh, that you run and the larger uh, uh, agency, the larger uh, commission, Health and Human Services yes, Commission, has tended not to be expressly political in, in the past, right? You know, you all try to be honest brokers and be an advocate for the issue, not for one side or another. So you really haven't been drawn into any of the political arguments over this. It's more just about policies. Absolutely. Right? We, we, I believe strongly that public health, mental health is bipartisan. Right. That, it's that, not that, a Democratic that, issue or a Republican Democrat, issue. That, that, that it, it doesn't matter, you know, what our personal beliefs can right. be. Uh, we are there to provide information uh, that the elected leadership can utilize to make the best decision possible. Right. But is it your view, looking at that issue in a, in a, in a, in a dispassionate and non-political way, is it your view that, that the issue was not getting sufficient resources behind it going into this session? Absolutely. We, we, um, again, if you look, however you measure mental health funding in, in the state of Texas, we rank near the bottom. Yeah. And there are consequences of that with individuals ending up in the, in the jails, like we heard earlier today, or in right. our hospitals. Uh, we've had major challenges with our hospitals in trying to get the resources we need in order to get individuals um, not waiting in jails to get into the system. Right. Uh, the, you know, the need for community services. And so there's a, a significant need out there. And I don't believe, again, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, um, I think both on all three sides understand that, that that's not in the best interest of good government in the state of Texas. Ch Chairman Van Depee, let me let's let's get right into the, the question of of, uh, of of which bills passed and which will have the most impact. I'm very pleased that this weekend we got to report on one key piece that I know you had a large hand in, and that was providing uh, an increase in available services funding to provide those services for our veterans coming back home. Talk a bit about that and why you felt like that was one important piece of the mental health conversation need to be had. The important everyday life in Texas is that we understand that we're a very military proud state, yep. uh, largest number of installations in, in the country. And with Fort Hood and Fort Bliss in El Paso and in Central Texas being the largest platforms for deployment, I mean, think about our kids who are now 13 and 14, they have lived in an era of constant war, whether it's Iraq or Afghanistan. And those returning warriors, um, the wounds that are not visible are sometimes the most severe. And we know that their culture is not to seek help. And so we built on the strengths of a peer-to-peer -peer network. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it really put funds into peer-to-peer -peer networks, knowing that warriors will talk to other warriors. And whether you call it battle fatigue in World War I or shell shock in World War II, we know that post-traumatic stress and particularly traumatic brain injury plays a part of that. Uh, we were able to get that increased funding, but it's not just the military member. What I think is very important about the bill and about what we did is that the key is the families, the spouses, the parents, the brothers and sisters, and particularly the kids. Usually those are the first folks that see any sort of symptoms of hypervigilance or alcohol abuse or change, very, very change in, in right. their behavior. So I think that one of the critical pieces is not just the funding, but the strength of that peer-to-peer -peer network and the outreach to the families. Senator or Chairman, I, I, I may be uh, naive in thinking that this ought to be, at least in part, if not entirely, a federal obligation, since they're going to war not for Texas, but for the country. I know the VA has seen better days in terms of the services it provides and the funding it receives. Why was this something that the state felt obligated to take on? I mean, on, on matters of border security, for instance, the state is very quick to say the federal government is defaulting on its obligation. Why was this not a case of the federal government defaulting on its obligation to our veterans. Part of this is how we fight our wars. 
you know, there are folks in National Guard and Reserves, and they are not attached to any one base. Right. And they have been deployed four and five times. And we know the relevance and the percentage of those that will experience behavioral health, mental health issues is directly correlated to combat time in theater. Yep. Uh, and these folks live in your communities. There's not a VA clinic around. There's not a major installation. And the only place they can access and the only place they trust is your local mm -hmm. behavioral health clinic, right. our local MHM, oh, you know, the old, the, I guess our dishes clinics, but uh, even faith-based providers. Yep. So that's where it's important. And Texas recognizes when the federal government either is reluctant to or because the funds doesn't, they'll usually step up to the plate. Uh, I was very excited to put on the emergency bill that passed. You know, we had only one psychologist for our 20,000 plus guards members. We had a rash of suicides. Uh, we had four in a six week period. We had a stand down. We said we have to do something immediately to get that bill emergency, to hire four more psychologists. So you to went take from care. one to five? We went to one to five, but we did it immediately when we walked in the doors. Uh, and that was the type of, of outcry that we had. We are all uh, just so saddened and shocked by the amount of suicides that occur in our military community, whether they're guard or reserve or active duty. And not only that, our veterans, way out proportional to the, the general population. Commissioner, I see you want to get in on this. Uh, absolutely. I, I think the, the, the importance of the bill and the peer-to-peer the, the -to -peer support is that a lot of the returning veterans don't, they're, they're afraid of going to the VA yeah. or, or going back because they're going to be labeled that the stigma that we've, we've talked about with, with yeah. mental illness. And that may interfere with what happens to them if when in, the, the, in the Army or the Navy, the, the, the uh, armed forces. And when they, they come back, so they're hitting our local mental health authorities, they want to talk to somebody that's gone through the same challenge that yep. they have. Yep. Uh, and you know, that, that they can trust, that they've gone through the battles, they, they, the same type of, of dynamics. Uh, so there's that trust that, that's there. Yeah. And that's where the peer-to-peer the -peer support is so critical. So what we, we do, it, we don't replace what the federal government's role is, um, but we have a system to match them with federal resources mm -hmm. or when they hit the local mental health authorities, meet, uh, uh, um, attaching them to somebody that's gone through the same type of experience. I wanted to add to that, uh, something else we did. In, um, in 2003, there are only three mental illnesses that can be covered uh, and certainly those people who have them be served because they were you know, truncated down to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and severe depression, which does not include uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome or disorder. Well, this session, what we did is put all of those back, uh, all the illnesses that were cut out yeah. in 2003 back into the array of illnesses that, that can be, people can get served for. And what I've heard from people who, and I know you've heard this more than me, they have to wait so long when they go to the VA yeah. that oftentimes the crisis can't wait that long. Right. And these are people who pay taxes in Texas. Why shouldn't they be able to go to the MHMR in their area or the, the center in their area to, to get care? Ch Chairman, why w was the list of, of uh, uh, coverable afflictions truncated before? Why was uh, it ever truncated? Save money. Save money? Yeah, because uh, at that time, it's really interesting. The cut was, they found the amount of money that they wanted to cut out. So then they cut the actual services to meet the amount of money. And right. everybody said, oh, it's such a good thing that we're going to continue to cover schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and uh, severe depression. But it left out so many things, right. psychoaffective disorder, psychotic, I mean, many things that, yeah. that people had. And it was hard to get back because everybody thought that was such a good thing. Well, we know that mental illnesses get worse. They start one place and they can build into a, a worse circumstance. Yep. And uh, fortunately, we had enough funds uh, to, to do that. In the 1115 waiver that, is, that we have is doing a lot of mm -hmm. stuff in mental illness around the state, and that allows us to, to pull that back in uh, and make sure those people are served. But the big one, and, and Governor Dewhurst and, um, and uh, uh, Chairwoman, oh, Lord, what's the Health and Human Services? Jane. Jane. Nelson. Nelson. Sorry. Yeah. Chairwoman Nelson was, was I, you have to excuse me, I'm like losing it. They were very helpful, uh, making sure that this happened 
because it, it was hard to do. I mean, it really right. was. Again, bipartisan support, which is a, which is a good thing to see. Now, uh, Chairman Coleman, let me ask you about a bill that we actually reported on just today on our on our site, and that is um, to provide adequate training to teachers to to intervene in cases or to suggest intervention in cases where they identify a potential mental health, mental health problem in, in schools. This is it's amazing to me to think about uh, that this didn't happen. Previously, but I guess you just take what you got. Right guess now, what? we have a new. It did. It did. Y'all just don't know. Okay. I passed a bill in in the uh, the session before in 2011 that does exactly the same thing. So Ex except yeah. it wasn't mandatory, and there were no funds for it. But otherwise, it was a great bill. No, but, <laughs> but let me yeah. be let me be yeah. really clear. Please. I've talked to the uh, the. The uh, people in, in Dallas in the Regional Education Center, they, they, they have fully implemented mm -hmm. that legislation prior to there being any, any money. They said it's going very well, and I imagine the things are the same across the state. Right. The real problem uh, is in rural areas, uh, and that the incidence of suicide continues to grow. Now, this came out of uh, bullying legislation that I filed because we could see that this was a public health issue, yeah. not just an, an issue of, of children who decide to commit suicide and we needed to do something. So yeah, I mean, no, it was implemented and, and it, it is done very well. Now that's different when you have funding to actually train teachers, right. which came in the bill with, uh, that I did with uh, Senator Duell, but also um, Senator Swartner had a bill that has dollars in it for the same thing. So I think that these, these extra dollars will mean this will go further right. than, uh, than anyone would have ever expected. How do you pass a bill in this legislature, let's be frank, that has anything mandated and also has new money? Well, it's interesting. There are people who helped uh, both times, as a matter of fact. Uh, Jeannie Morrison in the House stood up and said, this is something that we need to do. Yeah, uh, and John Davis stood up and said, "This is something we need." So to again, do. people who are not normally your ideological political kin, right? Yeah, right. But but but, it, but again, the, the the author in the Senate was Senator. Was Duell. Senator Duell, right? Uh, yeah. And it's quiet as it's been kept. That this was a uh, to give credit where credit is due. That bill was a, a, a major priority of, of Governor Dewhurst, yeah, and of the Speaker. And let me break in, Evan. Part of the thing was is it. The bill went through the Health and Human Services. On the education side, we had done an interim on in-school suspensions and out-of-school suspensions. And who, who, which of our students? Uh, we asked them to give us demographic data, racial data, gender. And I asked for students with disabilities and yeah. asked if that would be broken down. I think we were ashamed and embarrassed that what was happening in our public schools with respect to in-student and uh, I mean in-school and out-of-school suspension absolutely reflected the same data that we were getting in our criminal justice system. Yeah. When two-thirds of the students who are suspended have the same racial, ethnic, gender profile, only one difference, two-thirds have the label of ED, of uh, emotionally disturbed. Then you know that the behavioral problems that right. are being dealt with in the school are suspension, yeah. either in school or It looks or like a correlation. It was ex exactly. And so yeah. what we did is it wasn't just the Health and Human Services Committee. The education committees went, whoa, we are going down the wrong path. Right. And we've got to do something to make sure that we added mental health uh, professionals and that in the shacks, the school health yeah. advisory councils. It built on, you built on session by session, but the work that was done was both on the education side, but on the health side, I'm going to tell you, the education folks were embarrassed by the data. Yeah, mm -hmm. Commit, Commissioner, is this uh, the, the issue of, of kids with ED and the suspensions that Chairman Vandepeer is talking about? Is this more of a dishes issue or a TEA issue, or is it something where you both have purview of it, and were you able to work with the education community closely on this? Program? I think a lot of us, a lot, lot of agencies have a, a stake in, in the, this issue. Yeah, um, I, I think. One of the, the items that we were able to get support from, and it was to build upon well, one of the things that Senator Vandepute had done several sessions ago, um, was this Youth Empowerment Services waiver, the, the YES waiver. And this came out of a, re a report that we had, uh, and it discussed you know, the issue that, that many kids, if you don't get them the services they need in their home, 
um, they're going to get, end up in the hospital or something else is going to happen to them. Uh, and so, uh, and there was a lot of support from individuals in this audience that came and testified of how, how important that, that yes waiver was. Uh, and the, again, the legislature invested $24 million uh, GR, uh, like $54 million off funds in order to provide those critical services yep. for the kids in their, their homes. Uh, there were additional items related to education in the, the schools, and we, we talked about that already, and, and dollars to help destigmatize this whole issue so kids can get the services that, that they need. But, but again, I, I think our agency has part of this issue. Um, Department of Family and Protective Services has part of this, this issue of how do we improve mental health for, for kids. And TEA, all of us have part of this. this Everyone's issue. got a stake in this. Absolutely. Uh, Chairman Van de Peet, are there other particular pieces of legislation related to mental health that you look back on this session and think this was near the top of the list of the most important things we did? Well, for me, it was the realization that families are usually in different systems yeah. uh, when, when they're in crisis. Yeah. It may be child protective services may be on the DISHES side. It's usually attorney general, uh, the schools, uh, juvenile probation. And yet, none of our state agencies, our local agencies, were permitted to share data or talk to each other. So that a family in crisis would have a caseworker here, and a caseworker here, and a caseworker here. And I had a mom who had a child who was severely ill and said, I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. I can't keep making all these meetings. And she finally screamed. She goes, I'm not a case to be managed. Mm -hmm. So passing, we, we did something to the session before, but built on that so that that child doesn't have to go through five different system assessments, that we right. can share that data, and that everybody works together Streamline it. To, to get yeah. the family, that the services they need, without being so siloed. Right. I think that, well, the money was absolutely fabulous to, to get back, but we still need there. But it's that cooperation, mm -hmm. that collaboration. And it was really a program that we started here in Bear County called Bear Cares. I think you're going to hear some more about it with our great um, Haven for Hope folks. But it's how we share and we brought in juvenile probation, the yep. judges, and all the different systems say, how do we make this work for the families? We, we all have the same goal, but what we were doing were the best that we could do for them, but actually we were making it worse. Yeah. Chairman, how about you? If, uh, same, let me invite you to do the same thing. Is there anything else, you, one or two pieces of legislation that you would say? Well, I think the, the legislation that John Davis did, which came from a county affairs interim study with Haven for Hope, uh, uh, we, did, we toured the state, and part of our charge was to find out how we could divert uh, uh, people from the county jails because of the high census. And because the, the County Affairs Committee also has uh, jurisdiction over the Commission on Jail Standards, uh, that was causing our jails, the, the census of people with mental illness, was causing our jails to be out of compliance. Right. Um, and so one of the things we saw was that Bear County, and I keep saying this, Bear County had its act together. They were coming to putting, doing, uh, bringing all the pieces together in accomplishing those goals, yep. and that would work well in other places. Then last interim, we did the substance abuse and mental health, and again, all of this is, is geared towards diverting individuals uh, from our, our county jails. Well, just like you said before, well, you can divert a whole bunch of people, but if there's no money to serve them, it doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. Right. So now it all can work. Mm -hmm. uh, we can continue to divert people who don't need to be in our county jail and their services in the community uh, that they can get. Um, and I think that's one of the, the biggest things that, uh, that people really don't know happen. Mm -hmm. And it's going to really help every county budget mm -hmm. uh, so that they can move dollars to other things. Commissioner, we had two discussions. I know you were here this morning. We had two discussions, one on criminal justice and mental health, and Sheriff Garcia from Harris County and others talked about ways in which the new activity happening out of the 83rd session is going to impact what has been a very, very difficult situation, bordering on a crisis situation in some of our county jails. I, I thought the immigration and mental health conversation was fascinating, but there seems less clearly a resolution of that. We have an emerging Latino majority population. We have a lot of new people coming to the state of all races, quite frankly, a thousand people a day added to the population rolls. Some people who come to the state inevitably are going to need some help in the area of mental health, and it seems like there are some concerns specifically within the immigrant population on mental health, but not the, the legislative um, activity hasn't yet caught up with what seems to be an emerging 
issue. From the state's perspective, as you look at population growth, what do our legislators need to be thinking about? What do we need to be thinking about in terms of what the next set of needs will be? I think that's a great question. I think that the system right now is challenged. Uh, you know, however you measure it is, is, is challenged. I think there's some good things happening with this legislative session, the 1115 waiver, that the dollars that, you know, there's going to be about $2 billion through the 1115 waiver that's going to go into mental health services, about 370 projects across the state of Some Texas. of those will certainly touch yeah. the emerging immigrant yes. population. Yes, and, and so they're able to serve yeah. all individuals right. uh, through the 1115 waiver. Right. Um, I think some of the issues, the, the additional issues we haven't talked about, um, housing. Yep. You know, the, the, we were able to get some support for, for housing. Uh, that was the first time uh, ever that we were able to get that type of support. Uh, we made the case that if you're living on the street and you're mentally ill, you're not going to take your medicines. Right, but it's a first step. It's that, not, that's, it's that's not the first step. what you need all, entirely. No, th this was a, a good next, next step. Yeah. Um, I think substance abuse. I, I am convinced that substance abuse is one of the main drivers of poor health and budget woes in, in Texas. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to get the, the type of support uh, in the past. Uh, this legislative session, uh, we had the, the support, and we were able to get $25 million to improve substance abuse services in the state of Texas. And I, I think one of the, the, the big issues for us as an agency, um, inpatient care for individuals that, that are, are mentally ill. Um, you know, I asked for, and we got a, a, a rider on our budget to develop a 10-year plan uh, for the state mental health system. Yep. I, I, I would argue that that system was designed for where Texas was 70 to 100 years ago. Um, in know, the, terms the, of the size of the state or in terms of the complexity of the population? I, I think the, the treatment for mental illness has changed so dramatically right. that you know, 50 years ago, uh, having these, this system of hospitals uh, that, that can be a long ways away from the people that they serve, uh, these lar very large facilities, um, and I would, you know, if, if you've ever been to one of these hospitals, um, you know, I was talking to one of our superintendents uh, to today over lunch, you know, you know a, a building in the mid-70s is a new building. Uh, you know, many, many of these buildings uh, really were built 70 years ago, And probably, years ago. probably all kinds of infrastructure in those buildings, principally technology, would probably advance the cause of treating these patients in a way that would be consistent with the times, but it's lacking. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're, you're running uh, about a $2.5 billion operation, is that right? It's right now about $3 billion. About $3 billion. How much do you need? <laughs> you know, that, that is one of those questions the, that, that the, I can never the answer. The answer is free, even if the money isn't. So, um, you know, in a perfect world, which we certainly don't live in, but in, in a perfect world, to do the kinds of things you're talking about, Mm -hmm. What would you need, do you think? I, I think that's why for the, the, the inpatient system, we're doing a 10-year plan to develop a, a, a precise amount right. that it's going to cost. I, 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 I am careful about throwing those numbers out there until we have the data to, to back it up. But, right. but we need the, the, a critical look at the hospital infrastructure to, to say exactly what, what, it, what it needs. Well, let me put it in terms of two fights we just had, mm -hmm. or the two fights that we're kind of still having. Water is said to be a $53 billion problem over 50 years. Road funding is said to be a $400 billion problem over 20 years, at least. What would you estimate over a period of time you might need over these 10 years? I think there is that rainy day fund. You know how easy it is to get money out of that. I'm sure we could just dip right into it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, I, I, I'm careful about throwing those numbers out until we have the data. I think the system has to change significantly. I think giving you a number of what it would take to repair our hospitals isn't the right answer because I think that whole system needs to, to change. You it almost be, need to looks, scrape the lot it, and it needs to look right, yeah. significantly different than uh, what it looks right. like right now. I think coming out of this session with $330 million um, is a significant next game, uh, next step. And figuring out how, you know, I think one of the, the big challenges for us, and, and uh, Chairman Coleman, uh, I, I think, really understands this, is the 1115 waiver is bringing in, again, $2 billion, $2 billion right, yeah. over the next several years. And how does that interact with what we're doing through state GR right. uh, and um, all those, different, again, different pieces of the puzzle coming right. together? Chairman, let me go to the 1115 waiver and maybe more broadly to the question of 
getting money from the federal government of the sort that people in power in Texas are willing to accept? Well, unfortunately, we missed the big opportunity. Well, I, and I want, I want to ask about that, because while the Affordable Care Act has come up and the possibility of expanding Medicaid has kind of come up around the edges in, in the conversation today, the reality is whatever the legislature accomplished this session, one big miss is we started the year with 6.2 million uninsured Texans, 28.8% of the population. The Come the end of the legislative session, we had done exactly zero to rectify that problem. And I know there's a big fight over federal money and strings attached and mandates and all that, but the reality is there could have been more money in one respect available. 80 to 90% of the people who are seen by our local mental health authorities would have been eligible for Medicaid under the Medicaid expansion. And that means almost all of them would have had care, and we wouldn't have it forever. Right. Uh, and, and I think that that is a, a real missed opportunity uh, for people with any kind of chronic disease, but particularly mental illness. So, so the failure to address the issue in that way has direct impact on this conversation. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and Leticia knows this. Everybody knows this. How you solve people's need for care uh, who have illnesses is give them health coverage. You know, I, I started working on mental illness a long time ago, do, and, and Leticia was working, helping me do uh, parity. And what, what was really clear was that peop, the insurance companies didn't treat mental illness like other illnesses. And so if the insurance companies did, then the folks wouldn't be a burden on the public system. Uh, so, so the interesting thing is when you go through all that and you start pulling all the cords and pushing the buttons, uh, it's a matter of having health coverage. If I didn't work for the state of te Texas as a, a, a legislator, my bipolar wouldn't be covered. Most wouldn't likely. Right. It's a pre-existing condition. Uh, so, you know, I think that that is clearly a, a missed opportunity. Uh, it just goes without saying. Uh, and we can't give up on making that happen. Are you at all sympathetic? I mean, there are people in this audience of every political stripe. So surely there are some people in this audience who say, Yes, it would be great to have the money, but as a matter of politics and as a matter of the relationship between the state and the federal government, we don't want to be in the business of having the federal government's boot heel on our necks. Well, you know, it's really interesting. All those billions of dollars in that 1115 waiver are fed, it's federal money. Right. So why is that okay, but then the other money is not okay? Right. Uh, so I think that's the point. But again, you know, politics is politics. What can you do? You know, I mean, I, I don't... I was very hopeful that, that we could get there, and uh, it just did. Senator, you share you share the same chairman. You share the same point of view. Well, we had great expectations. Uh, Dr. Zerwas had a great piece of legislation that would allow us to to look at uh, the exchanges, which will start uh, enrolling October first. Um, there were folks, even on the Senate side, we had put some language in a rider that said, let's continue the conversation. Because we know that the federal government has said, we know what your governor's opposition is, he says, until we fix Medicaid, until we do that, we're, we'll work with you on that. Yep. But it was a political decision, but it has dire consequences. What that means is that while the marketplace, the exchange is going to start opening up October 1st, we didn't anticipate when the, when the law was written that those in the Medicaid expansion, and let me tell you, if it was called anything else but Medicaid expansion, it probably would have been done. We would have called it the parents of the CHIP program expansion. It might have worked. But it was mm -hmm. that, uh, it was the labeling it the, the Medicaid expansion. But what that meant on the conservative side, the numbers are about 900,000 working adults. On the high side, Kaiser Permanente says it's about 1.7 million working adults. Yep. All of them with yearly incomes less than $32,000. Do you know how many folks that covers in, in our communities? And those are the folks that need mental health. Young workers, uh, think about those 21-year-olds to 30-some-odd-year-olds who think they're invisible, right? I mean, we did when we, we, I think we did when we were that age, but I mean, they're going to, might get hit with a catastrophic illness, but we know mental illness knows no age barrier. It discriminates equally with the young and the old, and it is a, a it can be a devastating yeah. illness. This was a missed opportunity to cover that, leaving the 
truly, truly needy who have no other options right. to be able to get those services uh, from their local clinics. I mean, we could have really helped. Ch on Chairman, but in, in a perfect world, we could propose a what you heard Secretary Sebelius say just the other week, a Texas solution or something that was tailored more to our perspective on this. But in fact, not only didn't we do that, we actually tied the hands of, of Commissioner Janik in being our designated representative to negotiate with the administration on a way that we could access those dollars without subjecting ourselves to, to the requirements that expanding Medicaid entails. That's correct. So, so we're, we're, we, uh, in some ways, we, in terms of taking advantage of that money, we almost took a step back. That's why we had 22 right. chambers of commerce that sent Garnett and I resolutions and right. the legislature take the Medicaid expansion. Right. Uh, and we're adding more every day. They understand that right. for the businesses, particularly small businesses, who may not have the employees that have the biggest amount of salaries, yeah. that's a huge relief from... Uh, them be, having that responsibility. And that, I mean, 1.7 million adults, yeah. uh, that was too good to pass up. So I'm hoping that maybe the conversation will continue, that now that we've got the suits, as I call them, the CEO saying, this is ridiculous. Red states with very conservative governors in Utah, in Arizona, in New Mexico, Florida. all said yes. Florida, at Absolutely. least. Absolutely. They found a way. But, but, but Texas are you, are you not way. at all sympathetic to the idea, Chairman, that Medicaid as a system is broken or broken enough that before we hitch ourselves to that wagon, we ought to be sure that the wagon can move forward? Well, if Medicaid is broken, as the governor said, yeah. the federal government doesn't sign the contracts with the HMOs. The federal government does not set reimbursement rates. And the failure, I think, of our Medicaid That's system right. Uh, is that uh, not enough providers are there. The federal government has nothing to do with it. So before we start saying the federal government broke our Medicaid system, we need to look upon ourselves. And I'm glad we're taking the first step. Do you know that Texas is number one in the country for readmissions to the hospital 30 days post-discharge? Now, is that the failure of the federal government? No. We're not doing something right. And so for us to be able to point the finger at someone else, yeah. we really have to do a better job ourselves. I think part of it is reimbursement rates. I think part of it is you know, we're so big and so diverse geographically. Uh, good steps in doing those regional type uh, networks. The adequacy of the networks is, is very important. Uh, one of the things I wanted to touch on, education of health care providers. We've got a lot of mental health care providers. I'm sorry, they went to school with me and used slide rules. We need to, uh, I, mean, I mean, face it, we're under retirement. We have to, unless those reimbursement rates come up, and unless, and that's what I'm excited about, is that next generation of mental health professionals right. really needs to get the signal that, that Texas is going to be behind them before they're going to commit to a career in an educational cost yeah. to be a health care provider. C Commissioner Lakey, the, the Health and Human Service Services Commission institutionally and Dr. Janik as the executive commissioner have stayed completely out of this conversation. They've been unbelievably careful in not taking one side or another. They say basically, we just work here. You know, <laughs> we're going to let everybody fight about this. D do you have a point of view that you feel comfortable offering? <laughs> <laughs> or are you going to do this? I think, you know, you know it's, it's again, one of, one of those, uh, you know, situations where our, our job is to implement, obviously, a lot of controversy about this, yeah. th this position. In, in the midst of that controversy, our role is to figure out how we can improve services with the resources we have the, 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 uh, the best we can, improve yeah. efficiency, uh, take the case for additional services to the next legislative session, yeah. make sure that we're good stewards of the dollars that we just received and make sure that we're very effective at implementing the, these services. And elected officials, such as the folks sitting to my side, um, are, are the ones that are in that debate. And ultimately, you're going to get direction from what they do, mm -hmm. and then you'll pivot to some other kind of system of implementation depending upon what the outcome of that discussion is. Yes. And so, so we, we do the analysis of you know, what would be the impact on our current services, how many folks would be um, potentially have services under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so that we're ready, whatever happens, that we can make sure that, uh, that, that we're providing the right, right amount of services. What about on the exchanges? So Senator mm -hmm. Chairman Vandeput alluded to the exchange program, which mm -hmm. kicks in October. 
if I understand this stuff correctly, and it is complicated, people in the audience would be forgiven, I might be forgiven for not understanding it 100%. The opportunity existed for us to create a state exchange, which would keep the federal government's own exchange off our shores. Mm -hmm. We elected not to create a state exchange, so in some respects, as much as we hate the federal government, we effectively invited the federal government to take ownership over this because we declined to. Do I have that right? <laughs> the, the, the decision of, of whether or not Texas would, would make an exchange uh, was not within our, our agency, but, but there was a decision that uh, they would use the federal exchange instead of a state-run So exchange. that is actually, as of right now, what is going to happen. And how will the, the fact of the federal exchange impact the mental health conversation? There will be individuals that can get insurance through, through the exchange. Uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act has other ways that it, impl that it affects what we do. Uh, such as the coverage to age 20, 26 and pre-existing uh, pre conditions. Uh, the, and so there is, you know, we, we have to look in our agency, the, the number of individuals on each type of service yep. that now are eligible for the exchange. And uh, there's predictions and, and models of, of what are the resources that are in our agency that, um, actually there was some resources that were taken out of our agency on the, the modeling of the individuals that would go into the exchange. Mm -hmm. Let me ask before we open, and we will open it up momentarily to all of you for questions on both sides, and I expect to have as many on this panel discussion as I did on previous. Uh, let me ask each of you, beginning with Chairman Coleman, then Commissioner Lakey, and finally Chairman Van Pugh, what is the one thing that has not yet happened legislatively on this issue? With all the good work that got done during the session, surely it was not all problem solved, mental health is now fixed forever. Going into the, as you begin to think in the interim about the next session, what is the, 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 the next frontier on mental health that you would like to see the pink building tackle? I'll I, I go with Dr. Lakey on, the, on having beds available to individuals and finding a way to use our private infrastructure to do so uh, because people still need hospitalization. Um, and, and, and with that, uh, making sure that we did something great this session, but that we don't roll it back next session. So the idea would be not only new stuff, but don't undo the stuff you just did. That's exactly right. Right. Uh, Commissioner. I think we need to build upon what we did this session. I think the, the hospital plan is really critical to the future of, of Texas. I think uh, we, had, we had several pilots that came out of, of this session. We talked earlier today about the, uh, the jail diversion pilot money. Um, we'll be looking very closely at the data and, and, and hopefully be able to make the case that those type of pilots need to be expanded. I think, unfortunately, a lot of times we do pilots, and then those pilots stay pilots instead of being expanded. Right. And so using the data to, to say that, that we need to take not only that pilot, but the pilots that we put in with Department of Family Protective Services and other agencies and expand those. And I think data is going to be critical, uh, and people will be looking very critically at did we make a difference after the injection of $335 million, can you show a measurable, a measurable effect that resulted from those dollars? Can you? Is it, is it possible for there to be one, regardless of whether there is one or not? It is possible to see the fruits of that expenditure in two years? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah. Chairman? I'm so thankful for uh, the work on homelessness, on veteran issues, yeah. on mental health. But let me tell you what I think is an absolute travesty. And it does deal with mental health, but that's women's health care. With the cut that we've had on, on women's health care and those providers, for many women, the only opportunity that they have with no Medicaid expansion, and because we are so frugal, I mean, we cut women off our Medicaid program 60 days postpartum. Most states will have six months or a year after the birth of the baby. So, I mean, because there's a lot of behavioral health issues postpartum, uh, they call them the baby blues. But not only that, when women go for their annual checkup, uh, that's an opportunity to talk to a provider, a healthcare provider. For rural women and for a lot of women, that's, an, that's a missed opportunity. And so while not directly in the mental health, it desperately affects women when they don't have a place to go for their women's health care because that's a place that they can speak out and say, I'm having some difficulties, I'm a depression, I'm anxious, I'm not sleeping right. 
and they share that usually with their female doctor. They may not always share that with a primary care physician, but we do, and that's how women operate, and the loss of that, I think, will is going to be tremendous, not just for the women who won't get those pap smears, but for the missed opportunities in diagnosis and male, me mental health to be able to refer those women to get some services.